Monica and Augustine, Christian mother and son. Augustine, 354 to 430. In 354, Monica gave birth to her future pride and joy, a son to be named Augustine. Her lap became the center of learning and worship for him. The name of the Lord was often on her lips as she explained the story of salvation or sang hymns of praise to Jesus, the savior of her soul. Monica's pagan husband, Patricius, was no help in pointing Augustine to God, so she alone taught him to love and serve the Lord. She held fast to the promise of God's word. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. As Augustine grew, his father, recognizing his gifted mind, said, Our small town is no place to educate a boy of these talents. He must become cultured to do great things. So at the age of 16, Augustine was sent away to study under the best tutors in Carthage, the largest city in that part of North Africa. Monica urged him to cling to Christ and live a holy life, but once he was away from home, in an exciting city of the Roman Empire, the temptations of sin overpowered him. Though he dearly loved his mother, he fell into the wicked ways of his new friends. I despised my mother's advice and went headlong on my way, Augustine later admitted. Stealing, carousing, watching evil entertainments, and sins of every kind became his habit. I even used to pretend that I had committed sins which I had not done in order to impress my friends, Augustine said. Rejecting Christianity, he embraced the popular philosophies of the day, and Augustine grew proud. I will make a great name for myself, he said. Seized with fear at such news, Monica warned him, My son, I fear the crooked path you are walking, for that way is walked by those who turn their backs toward God and not their faces. Seeking out her bishop for help, Monica pleaded, Will you please speak to Augustine? Show him the error of his ways and teach him what is good. The bishop shook his head, for he knew well Augustine's heart and mind at the time. He is not yet ready to be taught, the bishop told her. He is full of self-conceit with the novelty of these new ideas, but leave him alone for a while. Only pray to the Lord for him. He himself will find out by his reading what his mistake is and how great is its sinfulness. Monica, unwilling to take no for an answer, wept and griped the bishop's hand, begging him to speak with Augustine. No, he said firmly. Now go away and leave me. It is impossible that the son of these tears should perish. The bishop's words, it is impossible that the son of these tears should perish, sounded to her as if they had come from heaven. Monica wept and prayed for Augustine, never losing hope that God would save his soul. Augustine, she often told him, the son of these tears shall not perish. The years passed, and Augustine became a respected teacher, but he continued to reject the Lord. At age 30, he moved from North Africa to Milan in Italy to become one of the head instructors of the city, bringing his widowed mother with him. At that time, the great preacher Ambrose was bishop of Milan. Augustine went to hear his sermons not because he wanted to know Jesus, but to listen to his eloquent words. Augustine told Ambrose that he did not believe in Christ. To Augustine's surprise, Ambrose accepted him in love. That man welcomed me as a father, Augustine said. I began to love him first not as a teacher of the truth, but simply as a man who was kind and generous to me. Gradually, Augustine began to hear the truth of God in Ambrose's sermons, and he started to read the Bible for himself. A friend gave him a book on the life of St. Antony. In it, Augustine saw how the grace of God could transform a life. Through it all, Monica prayed for his salvation and urged him to trust in Christ. As Augustine's doubts about the truth of Christianity faded, fears came in their place, fears that his many sins could never be forgiven. One day, overcome with guilt, he went into the garden to pour his heart out to God. His friend, Alypius, came with him. Suddenly, a storm rose up within Augustine's heart, bringing with it a downpour of tears. To avoid embarrassment, he ran alone to the far end of the garden, flung himself down under a fig tree, and cried out to God, How long, O Lord, will you be angry with me forever? O Lord, remember not my many sins. As Augustine wept and prayed, he heard the voice of a child singing the words, Take and read, take and read. He had never heard a children's song with those words before. Taking it as a message from God to read the scriptures, he grabbed his Bible, opened it at random, and read the first verse he saw. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Romans 13, 14. At once the Lord opened Augustine's eyes to see that only Christ's goodness could cover his sins. He did not read any further. He did not need to. The Lord had changed his heart. He praised God for the forgiveness of his sins and the gift of faith. Calling to Olypius, he said, 
When I read the verse, it was as though my heart was filled with the light of confidence in Christ and all the shadows of my doubt were swept away. Show me the passage you read, Olypius said. Augustine showed him, but Olypius' attention was drawn to the next verse. Accept him whose faith is weak. This verse is for me, he said. My faith is weak, but Christ can make me strong. Falling to his knees, Olypius put his trust in God too. The two friends rushed inside and told Monica. Overjoyed, she threw her arms around her son, saying, This is what I have prayed for all these years. With eyes brimming with tears, she lifted her hands to heaven and prayed, Praise to you, O Lord, for you are able to do far more than we can even imagine. You have turned my mourning into joy. From that day, an overpowering hunger gripped Augustine to know the Bible and worship God. I can't have enough of the sweetness of meditating upon the depth of your word, he prayed. What tears I shed in your hymns and how I am moved by your sweet singing church. Dressed in a white robe, Augustine was baptized by Ambrose along with many other converts in a candlelit Easter Eve service. He resigned his teaching job in Milan and planned to serve God back in North Africa. One evening as they were preparing to leave, Monica and Augustine talked late into the night. The greatest delights on earth, Monica said with a broad smile, cannot be compared with the joys of heaven. As we talked of God and eternal life with the saints, Augustine later wrote, our hearts thirsted for the heavenly streams. It was as if we had lightly touched the first fruits of the spirit in heaven. My son, Monica said, looking into her son's eyes, I don't know why I am still here on this earth. The only reason I wanted to stay a little longer in this life was to see you become a Christian before I died. Now God has granted me this beyond my hopes, for I see that you despise the pleasures of this world and have become God's servant. A few days later, she fell deathly ill. You may lay this body of mine anywhere, she told Augustine and the others holding vigil at her bed. Aren't you afraid to die and be buried so far from home? Someone asked her. Lifting her head, she answered in a weak voice, nothing is far from God. Augustine knelt by her bedside, overcome with grief, and held her hand and prayed until her spirit slipped away to be with God. I closed her eyes, Augustine said, and a great flood of sorrow swept into my heart. After burying his mother, Augustine returned to North Africa and eventually became the most important leader of the church in that region. Using the word of God as his sword, he fought many battles against false teachers in the church. His greatest challenge came from Pelagius and his followers. The Pelagians taught that Adam's sin did not affect all mankind and that it was possible to live a sinless life through their own free will. They believed salvation was not the gift of God, but was earned by men. Augustine recognized that these beliefs conflicted with the central teaching of the Bible that man is saved by God's mercy alone. For it is by grace you have been saved, wrote Paul to the Ephesians, through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Augustine poured all his energies into combating the Pelagians and lifting up the grace of God. He wrote letters, called church councils, and traveled widely, speaking to packed churches. Man was lost by free will, Augustine preached. But the God-man, Jesus Christ, came by freeing grace. See in Jesus Christ the freeing grace of God. After years of struggle, Augustine's message of God's grace and mercy won the day. For the last 40 years of his life, Augustine taught, preached, organized charities for the poor, and wrote books in defense of Christianity. His book, The Confessions, told the story of his life and the saving love of Jesus Christ. The entire book is a prayer to God, making it clear that he owed his salvation to the grace and mercy of God alone. O Lord, he wrote, you made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Throughout his long life, Augustine never stopped showing people the way of God, and he always thanked the Lord for his mother. God of my heart, he said, I joyfully thank you for all those good deeds of my mother, for they were your gift to me to save and guide me.